All right, hello everyone. You're listening to Cast Bitten, a Dungeon Synth podcast, and I'm the host Trev. And we are back from the winter hiatus, baby. And today we're joined by none other than Creaxiel. Creaxiel makes dark ambient dungeon synth. You just heard their track "Hills on the Horizon," and that one's from their debut album "Caverns Under the Wetland." That one's great. It's a track that to me feels uplifting and exciting but with a little more going on emotionally maybe a little uncertainty a little inquisitiveness mechanically there's this really great use of subtle driving percussion there as well as uh engaging counter melodies engaging counter melodies are something that i kind of just associate with creaxiel in general there's always a couple cool voices bobbing and, and weaving between each other and uh it always sounds so slick and so good so uh, yeah, welcome to the show. Thanks a ton for hopping on here. Uh, yeah, I'm really interested in learning more about you. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're having me. <laughs> um, so even even by the genre standards, there's very little information about uh, Creaxial online. So kind of the first thing I'm wondering, is this an intentional choice by you? Do you, uh, do you go um... for a bit of mystery? I just don't pay much attention to to social media or I don't know. <laughs> I see. So maybe that's just uh, a little more your personality type to be a little more reserved with what goes yeah. on online. Yeah, I think it's more like that. Oh, okay, that's interesting. But uh, I don't know. I'm I'm glad you decided to do this. It'll be a nice uh, kind of yeah. like I said. I'm really interested in learning more about you. So it'll be a, a, a nice little way to do that. <laughs> Um, so I guess the first thing that comes to mind here, uh, you've been releasing music under this project for about a year now. Um, yes. Is I'm oh, sorry, what was that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, about a year now. Uh, how how do you feel like you've grown as this has gone on? I know that you're, we can get into your timeline later. It's a little interesting, but it seems like over time you've gone a little more into the uh, like preference for ambient styles, but it's it stayed true yes. to itself the whole time. Uh, what's happened for you under the hood? So, hmm. <laughs> so actually, I started making covers under the wetland. I think in 2019 or something okay. like that. Um, but I just couldn't get it to sound good. <laughs> oh, so, really? <laughs> yeah. And that, that's the reason I didn't release it up until, I think it was December 2020. Yeah, early December so, 2020. Yeah. And the same happened with uh, my second album, which is Boreal Dusk. Okay. I started making it in, I think it's like January 2020. And then in December, or well, in November of 2020, I discovered this VST called Vital, and I just okay. got into sound design a little bit. And from that, I replaced all my sounds of uh, all the sounds of Caverns Under the Wetland with with the sounds I've, I I have been making oh, with this this VST. So. Um so yeah, I released Commerce Under the Wetland, then I released Boreal Dusk, and in 2021 I started making darker, darker, darker music in general. I, I don't really know why. <laughs> <laughs> it just I started experimenting with sounds and that's what I, I came up with. I came up with that. Wow, so so, yeah. so if I'm understanding it right, for, for Caverns and Boreal Dusk, uh, you wrote them and you didn't change uh, maybe like the notes being played, but you just changed the way they sound when you introduced right. that, that vital synthesizer. Wow, yeah, that's, that's, right. <laughs> that's so interesting, especially, uh, you know, months and months later, up, I guess up to a year if, if you started Caverns in 2019. So, uh yes. Was that something that you had kind of given up on them and then you came back to them? Or did it just, 
uh, not feel mm. finished until all of a sudden you introduced uh, the vital sense. Yes, I, I think it was more like like that last option. Mm, it's like the melody sounded right, but the sounds there was something that was lacking in the in the mix. Interesting. Uh, it was just, it was just that the sounds were were not very good. I was using some some VSTs I found on the internet, and I'm not very good at mixing. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, mm. yeah, no. Yeah, I guess for a little context there, um, at the time that you were making those first two albums, uh, was that your first musical project, uh, making music on computers? Uh, no, I the first music I made, aside from some piano melodies, like when when I was learning piano. I mm-hmm. think it was some melodies I made in Muse Score, which is a scoring program that lets lets you create some scores and play them. Yeah, I started make, making music like that. Um, then I I started making music with Reaper, and I made some electronic music. And then I discovered Dungeon Synth, and I was like, yeah, I want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> For this sure. Kind of music. Did you have the same hang-ups with the electronic music you were making, where you, you maybe liked the musical ideas, but you didn't like the tones? Or was that exclusive to the to the Creexil? Uh, no, it happened, it happened with the electronic music, too. <laughs> okay, so maybe just a learning curve there, where you're getting yes. your sounds yeah. right. Um, so maybe now on, on things like A Dormant Path, now that uh, you've kind of fell into your stride and, and uh, gotten a little more familiar, do you use Vital for everything or have you kind of expanded into other VSTs? I, I still use Vital for, for everything. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and, well, I do some river like this. Tal River and some EQ, the stock okay. EQ from Reaper. But for sounds, I, I just use Vital. Wow, and you totally get by with that. That's uh, I haven't looked too deep into Vital, but I've always heard high praise from it. So that's interesting yeah, to hear right. how ubiquitous it is in your music. And it, was, it was very important because Vital is like very complex for a, for a free VST. Right. And, and actually, the music I make now, it's a product of trying stuff with Vital, basically. <laughs> oh, that's neat. Yeah, sometimes you, at least in my experience, I'll get a new VST and uh, whatever it gives me access to kind of gets the gears churning and uh, yeah. it really colors the music that I end up writing, which is which is neat. Maybe that plays a role into uh, like your release, A Dormant Path, which was made kind of after finding all that. Yes. Do you feel like... Uh, like vital is it all responsible for gearing a little more towards ambient music or was that just kind of a natural flow of your taste i think it's more is it may it may have have some something to do with that mm-hmm. but really you can make a lot of sounds and basic, and a lot of kinds of styles of music with vital so so I don't know. I think it's more just like a personal taste. Okay, yeah, I can totally see that. And it's not to say that your your early albums didn't have similar kind of roots, especially Boreal Dusk. I can see a lot of crossover with the sounds on Dormant Path and on that one. Yes. The, I think the only thing I didn't do with Vital was the percussion in Caverns Under the Woodland. Oh, that makes sense, yeah. I, I well, record what's the source that, there? I record there, um, like the box of the, like the headphones box. I, I hit it with something and <laughs> no recorded way. that, and that's that's the percussion basically. <laughs> that's that sound, the yeah. the driving percussion I was talking about was just hitting the headphone yes. box. <laughs> oh, that's so cool! Did you uh, 
like doctor it up with any effects with reverb or anything like that yes, or is it just I, okay i put some mickey on reverb that's that so back. exciting <laughs> wow wow that's something i've got to give a try i've never made my own samples there i found some online and then kind of uh edited a, them from there and, and i know e-ring has a big sample pack that i've used before but uh i don't know that goes to show what you can make with <laughs> with so little yes so you mentioned a little piano. I feel like it makes sense to kind of step back in the timeline there. How did you uh, like very first start uh, start in with music? Was it with piano? Yes. So when I was like eight years old, I was sent to piano lessons. Okay. And at that time, I didn't really like it, um, but I liked to create music at that time. Um then I learned some more piano. I, I did like two years or three of piano lessons. Oh, yeah, it's pretty significant. And music theory. And I didn't really do much else. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I practice some melodies and, and things. And uh, you mentioned you learned theory in lessons. Is that something that you stuck with? Does theory influence your writing now? Um, not really. <laughs> no, it's I, much more by ear. I, I'm sure it it has influenced me uh, at least a little bit. Yeah, but it's not like I have I have the music theory present in my mind in my mind when I'm doing music. Okay, really. if you can kind of channel that and explain it, what do you feel like you have present in your mind? What's going on when you're coming up with something? I, it's just trying stuff. And when something sounds sounds good, then I write it on Reaper, and I start from that. Um, there's not much rational thinking when I make music. <laughs> mm, it's just that it's just trying trying sounds, then writing some melody, mm, like. I bought a MIDI keyboard some time ago, but before mm-hmm. that, I I played all my music on on the keyboard, on the normal keyboard. Oh, really? With the like the one that Reaper has built in? Yes. Playing oh, that's with. so funny. Yeah. It's surprisingly intuitive. Like it's laid out like a piano would be laid out, but I yeah. haven't heard of anyone writing that way. Then, like, I, I tried uh, melodies with that. Then I write and I wrote them manually. Mm. But but it was a great source of inspiration. Yeah, I can imagine that. What was it like transitioning from doing that into working with the MIDI keyboard? Did it feel it's more comfortable? Better. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine really that. Better. Especially For because sure. you can you can play with the pressure of of the notes. Right, which is something yeah. you don't have in a normal yeah. keyboard. <laughs> you would have to edit each note's velocity by hand uh, yeah. in the MIDI afterwards. That's funny. Yeah. Oh, so how um, you mentioned that you would kind of uh, write on piano before just coming up with melodies. What made you decide to go from that into something a little more uh, like carefully crafted, like making songs and albums and uh, realizing ideas all the way through maybe well i had a computer so i downloaded the reaper right. and i just started <laughs> making music yeah i don't yeah, think there's fun. yeah there's nothing very much very complicated behind it so yeah, i can totally see that yeah i, I just like music so i, I figured i would make some music <laughs> Yeah. Have you ever tried um, any workstations other than Reaper, or is Reaper still uh, like your go-to? So I use Reaper because it's free. Well, well, it's not free, but you can it's use it for free. Sort of free. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, I mean, it's very cheap. Right. And and I think it's very comfortable. Like it's. It's really easy, easy to use once once you know it how to use it. For it's sure. not complicated. Um, and I tried FL Studio, like the demo version, 
Mm -hmm. And it's good to. I just use Reaper because because it's really cheap. <laughs> right. Yeah. And once you get comfortable in something like that, uh, yeah, it's hard to switch to something else. You you know where all the hotkeys, uh, what they do, and uh, where everything's located. I can yes. totally see just sticking with that. I'm in the same boat. I got Reaper because it was free, and uh, I've just always really, you know, like we said, semi free. And uh, then I got comfortable with it. So once I started using it a little more seriously, I couldn't really justify switching to another workstation. Yeah. So switch, switching to another, unless it really have, unless it has some features you don't have on Reaper, there's right. not much much reason to switch. So to talk about your albums in particular here, I, I know. Boreal Dusk is uh, very much an intentional winter synth album with the the artwork and the titles of the tracks and the overall sound. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's got that winter feeling. Uh, I guess to start off, can you talk a little bit about that? Maybe about what winter synth means to you and uh, if you're trying to intentionally make wintry music, what stylistic choices do you feel like are are important to getting into the zone there? So I think the winter theme of that album came came from the kind of fluty sound I use on it. Okay. Um, which which kind of reminds me to to this to the winter theme a little bit. Yeah, it's very evocative. And actually, the the tra the name, the track names, and the artwork. I thought about I thought about it uh, after making the album. I didn't How really. How interesting! I, re I didn't really think like, oh, I, this album is going to be winter synth or something like that. It just I just thought, hey, this sounds like winter synth. <laughs> Oh, okay. So, so this is a little more after the fact. Yes. Uh, like a categorization. Yeah. That's that's pretty cool. The track names, they're great. They do a good job of setting the scene there. And uh, that's an important part of kind of coloring a, uh, a release like that. Uh, especially like snow gazing. Yes. That's, uh, that's such a cool <laughs> track name. That's a cool term to me. Yeah, that's an interesting track because... I wanted to try something like more light, like mm. less darky, and I think it, I think it turned it out quite good. Yeah, absolutely, I do too. Uh, I forgive me, I'm super uncultured. I know you live in uh, Spain. Is the part of Spain that you're in uh, is winter a part of your life there, or is winter something a little more? So I live in the. To you? I live in the north of Spain, which is okay. way greener. And winter, I do the part of the winter that is cold. Yeah, I, I have that. Mm -hmm. Not that much snow. Like it rarely snows when in the part I am. I live in, but but you can see snow in some places. Sure, yeah. it's great. Okay. Is snow something that uh, you associate a little bit with, with like fantasy or some of the other kind of core elements of, of dungeon synth? Mm, a little bit, but I, I just feel like I don't have any particular associations with that. Yeah, sure, that to totally makes <laughs> sense. Um, with with. Uh, caverns, which uh, it seems like you were writing those at similar times. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I guess what was the overall uh, kind of aesthetic choice that you were going for there, if there was one? And was it similar where you wrote the music and then reflected back on it to try to see what you saw? Or well, uh, in that out? case, I started making like I think it, I think it just, I started making the first song, and I knew I had. There was like a swamp in my mind when I thought of of this music. Okay, cool. So that one was um, like 
prior the time the theme was emerged while i was making the music not not after that yeah i can see how that's a little different then yeah you did a pretty cool job with getting the i don't know swamp synth sound and then kind of the icing on the cake the cover art and the track titles and everything really fleshes it out yeah the cover art is really good <laughs> is uh is there anything different about a dormant path your most recent release uh was that one that you had a more firm idea going into it or was it similarly kind of discovering it along the way or uh in a dormant path at it? It, in a dormant path i didn't really have i struggled a bit with giving the names the song names and and the overall theme because i didn't really think of anything when listening to that music to my own music interesting so i, I kind of struggled while making the, the overall theme of the of the album so i i think i wanted to make it like a more rainy as associated with forest and rain hmm. But the the theme of the of that album is not as strong as right. The it's a little looser conceptually, which is fine in its own way, and it kind of lets yeah. the music uh, develop its own relationships for the listeners there. Yeah, you mentioned. Uh, I, I think you were just uh, praising the caverns under the wetland cover art. I remember noticing uh, that you had done the artwork uh, for a dormant path. And that wasn't the case for the first two albums. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? What was the reasoning there and what was that like? Oh, there's not much reason. It was a bit it was a bit like since I didn't have a, a special thing I wanted to convey with the artwork, I wasn't sure what I didn't what I wanted to do. Mm. So the artwork for my third album is just a photo of of where I live, of a, of a <laughs> forest near where I live. That's cool. And um, uh, did you just doctor it up with like uh, like Photoshop or a program? Yeah, like that? I put I put a ton of effects. Of <laughs> yeah, it's very paint. saturated. It's a cool stylistic choice. Yeah. Yeah. Do so, you feel like? Um, I don't yeah. know, choosing a place that you lived, uh, does that relate to any of the themes that you kind of discovered with the album? I, I know you said it's a little loose, but uh, I guess what I'm thinking is, is it a, a choice to include this personal part of yourself here? Or was it more just that uh, you liked the stylistic choice of the image there? It was more like I didn't really know what to do with the artwork. <laughs> I see, yeah. Because I had to put an, an artwork that not only was there but but combined with the music so and i struggled with it because i didn't really know what to do with it what what kind of artwork to put so it's the best thing i could come with come up with <laughs> yeah i think it's a great choice i feel like that undersells it uh... yeah but there's nothing special behind it Right, there's not deeper meaning. It's it's just uh, nice artwork. I totally get that. Yeah. Um. So a thing that I'm kind of connecting from talking about the albums, they're all very uh. They're 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 very visual and kind of tied to a a place or a location, uh, kind of like a setting. Maybe is a better term yeah. for it. Yeah. Whereas um a lot of stuff in kind of the the dungeon synth realm. Uh, they're tied to like stories, uh, you know, things in media like that, like movies, books. Does any of that play a role in your writing? Uh, do you Not have, I, I don't know, non-musical influences like literature? Or, or well, things I have like a that? lot of, I have a lot of non-musical uh, influences. Oh, okay, but they don't, they don't play a direct role on my music. Unless I think it, because I think like the second track of my third album is a reference to Dark Souls. 
a nice... Oh, I was wondering that, actually. Yeah. Uh, maybe like to the painted world? Yes. Yes. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Aside from that, I don't think there's any movie or any book that inspires me directly. So, yes, mostly video games. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, oh man, that I'm um, I'm grinning ear to ear that that's the one that made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what other games do you feel like, uh, even if they're not directly tied in, will kind of, I don't know, set the mood for you or, or draw some sort of subtle inspiration in writing? So, aside from Dark Souls, which def- which I've been playing a lot lately. Okay. Um, I feel like Morrowind is a great one. A ton of artists reference that. Yes. That seems very influential. Um, And also Heroes of Might and Magic. I don't know if you... I'm not familiar with that one. Okay, so it's a strategy game with great music. It's it's a great... It was very inspirational for me. Okay, awesome. And... That's for the ambience part. The other games that influence me influence me because of the music, especially. <laughs> yeah. Like Ori and the Blind Forest, or okay, or other games. Yeah, I mean that plays such a huge role in getting engaged and getting in on the experience and everything. Especially yeah. with strategy games, I feel like the music there because you're you get so lost in the tasks that you're doing with the strategy that you really get like absorbed in whatever they give you in the background. So it's, it's nice. Yes, to that's be... true. <laughs> yeah. Good. You know, Oh, that's really interesting. Uh, just to be totally gratuitous because I love dark souls. Uh, have, have you played them all? Do you feel like uh, there's one in particular that influences you a little bit more than the others? Well, each, each one of them has its own strengths. Yeah. I, I feel I the love... same way. Yeah, I love the first one because, especially the first half of the game, it's yeah, great. like ringing the two bells and everything. Yeah, so awesome. so strong. Yeah, yeah, I think the the thematic of the first half is is so strong, and really stuck with me. Then the second two, it's great. It, it's overall is is good. So, it's not like it has like a special strength but overall it's good and very memorable sure yeah and then the third one i just love the the theme and the bosses yeah yeah it's so slick it's it's fast and modern and the yeah the whole world kind of being at the end of things and falling apart is just it's a really neat setting it's really inspiring it's really good yeah, like your track "When a World Rots," I feel like that that really does fit a lot of the themes uh, going through that. Yeah, and the the name of that track, I think I came up with it while I was making the track. I, I don't know; I, it just sounded like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome! Yeah. So, what about musical influences? You mentioned. Uh, that you you were making electronic music and then you sort of discovered Dungeon Synth and thought, oh, I want to make that. Were there any artists that really provoked that from you? That desire to create stuff within the genre? Yes. So my I think my first discovery in the genre was Bindkalder, which I really love. Oh, Indian. I don't think I'm familiar with that. Maybe I'm not pronouncing it well, though. Vindkaldr, <laughs> Vindarkaldr. I don't know how it's pronounced. <laughs> okay, it's it's a constant issue within the genre trying to pronounce yeah. all these made up words. <laughs> well, it's it's the artist that has ambient one. Okay. And enchantments of old lore. I don't know if okay. you're familiar with them. Let me check out the cover the cover art right there. But yeah, maybe not. I'm a little, overall, a little new to the genre, in all honesty. Uh, so yeah. there's like a ton of, of heavy hitter classics. Yeah, there are a that, lot that of... I've, I've kind of slept on. 
Yeah, there's a lot of music in this genre, and right, a lot yeah. of it is really good. Yeah, this is one I've seen the cover, but I just haven't given it the time yet, so I definitely got to throw that on the short list. Yeah, I, I love that release. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's a tough one to pronounce. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Vin Calder. That's then another, another artist I discovered very early that really stuck with me was Elixir. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I have that one, yeah. I really loved um, the release Ghost of Voskus Cabus. And well, also Thief, of course. Of course, yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's uh, that's another constant on the show. So many people, their first exposure, and, and myself as well, is through Thief, and then just kind of get sucked in through there, through those fun melodies. Yes, which is interesting because it's kind of different to a lot of dungeon synth. It's right, really it's like very a... medieval. There's not as much of yeah. the synth sound within it as you may associate with the genre. Yeah, but it's really great. Of course, yeah. Do you, uh, I guess when you have a musical influence like that, how much does that affect your actual writing process? Like, do you use uh, reference tracks? Like, are you going back and, and listening to a song that you like as you're making a new song? Or is it more that, these influences just get you in the mood to make this type of music. Yeah, it's it's more like first I listen to the music and then I make my own music, but I can't really refer to any tracks while I'm making music because within the genre, everything's very different. Yeah. And I, I can't find anything that is very similar to my music. So I don't really have any reference tracks when when making music. Okay, that totally makes sense. But but it definitely plays a big part before making it. It really sets me in the mood. Yeah, that makes sense. Is uh, I guess before you were making Dungeon Synth, was the uh, was there any particular I guess subgenre of electronic music if that was it or maybe a different music that kind of inspired you to start creating those earlier steps yeah definitely i don't know if you're familiar with the game toho no i'm mm. not how do you spell that uh, it's japanese but it's oh. toho <laughs> or toho i don't i don't know okay but it has some electronic music and i really love it and this was it was my main inspiration for making electronic music. Oh, interesting. That's really cool. So this whole time it's very very video game heavy it sounds like. Yeah. Like that's kind of the the main source. Yeah. Are there any um other non-musical in- influences outside of games or is that pretty much the like that's the main credit for it? Well, of course the Tolkien books play a big <laughs> Okay, it's yeah. Hard. Almost goes without saying. That's that always comes up when yes. have stuff like that. But they're great and they're so foundational for so much, uh, especially fantasy, but even outside of the genre. Yes, that's that's true. Yeah, I can totally I can totally see that for sure. Uh one thing a little more on the technical side that I was uh I don't know, kind of wondering as I was listening, do you get your albums mastered? They have a very like clean, warm sound. And I uh, notice in the notes uh, that it doesn't say anything about that. Uh, yeah, what's what's going on there? Okay, so, so I've done the mastering and mixing by myself. Oh, really? Oh, wow, and I'd love to talk more about that. Except for the third album, actually, I don't feel really comfortable with the way it came, it turned out, like the mixing. Oh, really? Like in Caverns Under the Wetland, I feel like the low end is too high, especially the, the reverb part of the low end. Mm. It's kind of muddy, <laughs> which is something I, I would change if I were if I were to remaster the album. Yeah. But overall, I think it sounded pretty good. 
Yeah, it sounds super professional. Especially it, within this genre where it's not necessarily a requirement to have the very professional sound. Uh, it's nice to kind of go above and beyond and, and have that. Even if, uh, like, I wouldn't, nothing stood out to me as muddy, but I, I know when you listen back to your own stuff, there's always little, you know, there's stuff yeah. that you want to change. It, it also depends on which device you listen to music. Oh, yeah. That has been maddening uh, for me with, with releasing music lately, uh, trying yeah. to do the mastering myself. I'll, it'll sound so good with one device, and then I'll do a different pair of headphones or I'll do someone else's car. And, and I just have a, a laundry list of changes I want to make. Yes, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's really frustrating when it sounds really good on one device and then on the other it sounds kind of bad. Right. Um, so it sounded like a dormant path. You were maybe uh, a little less pleased with how the final, uh, not the songs themselves, but the final master sounded. Was that it? No, it's actually on the contrary. Like, I I'm more comfortable with the oh, okay, result okay. of Dormant Path. Maybe because I knew more what what I was doing, and I chose the sounds more carefully, and I had more experience too. That makes sense. Yeah, a lot of times, uh, having uh, like good sounds on the instrument and then a good mix makes the mastering so much easier. You know. Yeah. You don't have definitely. to like make aggressive choices to cut out uh stuff that was kind of a mistake earlier in the chain. Yeah, that's 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 huge because maybe when you're making a sound or or choosing a sample or whatever, mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't really fit and then it seems like it is a mixing problem, but in reality is is a problem that can that comes from, from the sound. It's right. Safe. Yeah, that can be tough. And by that, by the time that you realize that, uh, you know, the song's typically finished if you're working on mastering, and it's, yeah. uh, it's a whole mess to deal with, I guess. What does yeah. your mastering process look like? If if you can explain it, do you know? Well, um, do you have a very complicated chain of effects? No, not really. In fact, I don't master my 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 songs. It's just okay. mixing. Okay, yeah. I made I make individual changes to the tracks. I try to listen to like what is sounds right and what is doesn't sound right. And then I make changes to the instrument that cause those problems. And I can see that. The the only mastering I do is I put all of my songs in a single reaper project and I export them. So that they are all the same level. Oh yeah, that makes sense. And um, so yeah, I think the most I have done is like putting some EQ on a track. Okay, that's what I was going to ask about. Uh, do you feel like you EQ a lot of your instruments individually when you're kind of tidying up a song at the end? Yeah, always. I, <laughs> okay, I have, always. I have EQ on most of my instruments. Right. Not not only the vital integrated EQ, but another EQ okay. that maybe cut it cuts the low frequencies or the high frequencies or whatever. Yeah, yeah, just trying to notch out a spot yeah. for the instruments or or getting rid of frequencies that are less desirable or something like that. Yes, it's a really complicated process in the end. Yeah, and there's oh, it's it's. It's so fine. The details are are so small and particular. It kind of uh, it's hard to really wrestle with it and be super happy with the final thing and not feel like there's more tweaking to be done. Yeah, and and you really have to trust your ears, and it's a lot of experience based. Yeah, totally. So, um, it's been quite a while. We were kind of talking about the timeline on. Bandcamp, your first two albums were both in December of 2020, and you kind of explained that there was a lot more to it to that. Uh, but so those those were released then, and then A Dormant Path was this past July. 
are you working on a, a next album uh, for this project or for another one? Yeah, What's so going on there? A little note is in my country, Boreal Dust was released on was released on twenty twenty one. Oh, I really? released like at midnight. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So yeah, for oh, Hour. it's December thirty first. So on the yeah. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> uh, so to answer your question, um, yeah, yes, I'm working on new stuff. I have a song that's like twenty minutes long. I'm trying to finish it. And I don't know what the art what the artwork will be. Wow, um, twenty minutes though, that's huge. Yeah, it's I plan on releasing it like an EP. Because I don't have anything that matches with the style of that song. Right. But it's well, that alone is a really different direction of one really long piece like that. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's a different creative process too because it's not like it's 20 minutes of the same but it's like a melody ends and then something similar but quite different starts and it's a different creative process making a long song or saying sure. okay i cut it and i start to use it yeah i can see that it has to flow and blend and I imagine it's more like creating different movements than creating different tracks all together. Yes. Ah, uh, oh, that's pretty cool. Well, that'll be like a unique addition to your discography. You know, that'll offer something pretty different. Yeah, it's more on the line of on the line of a dormant path. It's more similar to that album than the other two. Okay, and uh, I guess mechanically. Is it structured similarly where it's uh, mostly with vital synthesizer and, and maybe percussion samples here and there? Yeah, it's, it's all vital. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah, you're really selling me on it. I got to actually give it a serious look. I've, I've never checked it out. Yeah, it's, it's a great VST. Yeah. What, uh, so is, has anything changed about like the process of writing melodies and, and, uh, maybe chord progressions or any structure like that between uh, this new EP and a dormant path. I feel it's well. It's kind of difficult to rationalize that because my music creation process is is based on mostly feelings. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah, I, I don't think what I'm. I, what I'm doing. I see. <laughs> yeah, I'm like you were saying music. earlier, you you feel it out in the moment. Yeah, like oh, I feel like this melody could work with the song, or this texture, or this kind of sound, and then I add it. And if it sounds great, then I leave it. So, it's I work like that with with this EP, just as with the other albums. Okay, so overall, it's kind of a, I don't know, like a newer, like a new approach with this different structure, but the, like the core of the the elements that you're writing is from the same perspective. Yes, definitely. Oh, yeah, really neat. All right, well, I am totally down to the bottom of my notes here. Uh, I think I feel like I covered everything I was hoping for. Is there anything that you were hoping to to like dive into or to explain? Anything on your mind here? So I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so I was on a side note. I, I was thinking of releasing like the presets, the vital presets I made. Maybe oh, could whoa. Them. I could release them for free. I, I was thinking of doing that. So that's just something kind of. Uh, that's been on your mind that might be on the horizon. I think that you should totally go for it. That would be really cool. Yes. Especially for people uh, kind of like me who are, haven't used vital before. It'd be nice to just get the, get the fast track, see what you can do with it as far as dungeon synth goes. Yeah. 
is uh I don't know. Do you have any firm plans there? Do you have like a uh, like a timeline for how you'd like to release it, or is it just kind of something, you know, well, more I, or less cooking in the back of your head? I actually have them prepared. Like there, I just put the names to the presets because normally they are random names I came up. Oh like right. <laughs> so I just put the names to the presets, and and I can release them. I, I'm not oh. sure where to release them though. Uh, yeah, I don't. That's the type of thing like people would really want to have access to it, and I can't think of like a, like a one-stop place that you would put them. Yeah, so I was thinking about that. No, maybe I just store it in Google Drive and send a link. <laughs> Yeah, I if I remember right, um, if you're familiar with Francis Roberts, they were on the on on the podcast, and yeah, I think that they have something like that, like a Google Drive of some some presets and some sounds that they had made. So okay. maybe that's a a good way to do it. I'll check that then. Oh, that's so exciting! I feel like people are gonna love that. Uh, people are gonna be really interested. Yeah. Cool. Well, <laughs> that's interesting. Atop, uh, on top of the, the EP, that's something that people can look out for, the the real Creekzill experience, the the nitty gritty, all of the all of the presets that you've been using. Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, well if uh I guess if it's something that you put out soon, you can just let me know and uh I don't know, I can I can uh, like if, if you post it somewhere, I can pop that in at the end of the show when I do the outro, something like that. People are going to love that. They're going to be so interested. Yeah. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, if you don't have anything else, I guess we'll head out from here. Thanks so much for coming on. So just one more thing is um, make sure to check out the the person who made the artworks for my first two albums sure let me pull that up i have that in the notes um is it uh lautaro castro is that how you say their name yes okay and their instagram i have it here it's uh lautaro underscore cg underscore right yes okay great um, and then check him because his artworks are really good yeah oh my gosh the caverns artwork especially is so neat yeah. and then you have an instagram as well right is it just uh is it just your project name creek seal yes creek seal i, I don't okay. use a lot of instagram but right um is there anywhere else i know creek uh oh, it's just that I'll, I'll, just that well, that's the main the YouTube spot. channel and... oh yeah yeah you have a youtube channel i imagine that's the same name yes okay excellent so for the fans you've got all these spots to check their work out you've also got the artist uh, lataro castro lataro cg on instagram and a potential new ep coming up something to be excited about uh, potential vital sound pack something also to be excited about so yeah stuff to keep your eye on All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on. It was, uh, yeah, it was super fun talking to you and getting to know you. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, thanks for so much for having me. Awesome. All right. Take care. Same. <laughs> All right. Sup, friends. That was Creek Seal, a real dungeon synth legend, and I am really happy to have spoken to them there. It's so interesting, uh, you know, when you listen to someone's album so much and then you get a chance to see what they were thinking when they made them and what all went into the production and what went into the writing there. It's really, really great. So be sure to go check them out at creekseal.bandcamp.com and that's C-R-I-E-C-Z-I-E-L. Creekseal. Be on the lookout for their new EP, as well as for a potential vital preset pack, it sounds like, which will be neat. And uh, also at their recommendation, check out their artist, Lautaro underscore CG underscore on Instagram. Uh, Lautaro is L-A-U-T-A-R-O uh, underscore CG underscore. 
they've got a lot of cool stuff on there. I popped in and checked it out. Uh, yeah, just so much, so much neat stuff. Uh, in Trev news, there's plenty going on over here. I'm going to try and keep it brief. Uh, my new album, North Order, comes out this week. Uh, it comes out on Wednesday, January 19th. And I'm really excited. It's 11 tracks. It's about 35 minutes. And uh, it's something that I've worked really hard on. So I'm super excited to share it with everyone. I just released a new single last week from the album. And uh, that's titled A Great Journey of Great Hardship. You can listen to that wherever you listen to music, you know, on, on Bandcamp, on the streaming apps, on YouTube, all of that. Uh, I've also still got tapes for Seize It With Thine Own Hands uh, out there in the world. They're for sale on uncomfyrecords.bandcamp.com. And uh, I've still got Gas Bitten t-shirts. <laughs> if you want those, there's a, a few floating around. So cursebitten.bandcamp.com slash merch is where you're going to find them. There's going to be some really cool merch uh, and some tapes as well, it seems, for the new album, too. Although I'll be giving out more on that in the near future. Uh, all right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks to Creek Seal for coming on the show. Uh, yeah, take care, everyone. Get out of here.